space. It's a new frontier. Why don't I wreck it? I've destroyed the Western. I have made fun of the horror genre. Silent movies have fallen under my axe. What haven't I spoofed? And I said, oh, I know. <laughs> I know. Space. I am the keeper of a power known throughout the universe. The Force? No. The Schwartz. I think Spaceballs being a spoof of science fiction movies, it makes it particularly poised to be memorable. When Mel Brooks does a satire on a on a famous story, which he did with Spaceballs. It's very close to the original story, but it just takes a sort of a left turn, so that it just becomes a little silly. Well, I think the space genre was, was ripe for satire. No one had tapped into it yet. So you had characters easily identifiable. All rise in the presence of Dark Helmet. I sent the script to Lucas. I said, if there's anything that offends you, he called and he said, please, you know, I, uh, I saw Blazing Saddles, I've seen Young Frankenstein. I, I trust your judgment. I can't breathe in this thing. As a matter of fact, ILM, which is a George Lucas company did all our post-production film work. Yogurt! Hello, boys! I think it's a spoof on Star Wars. I think. Are we through? You cannot spoof anything that you really don't love. There's so much product out there. Laugh your butt off at something that we all know very well. It's not hard to make satire of that stuff because it's bigger than life. There's a very, very long spaceship that you can have fun with. I mean, it, it's, it's almost like the beginning of a porn movie. You had all those easily identifiable elements with those products. You know, you had the princess in distress and you had aliens, uh, strange looking aliens. And of course you had good guys and bad guys. I remember his approach to all the characters was, had a great deal of affection, you know, so there was never any attempt to really like have a character just be kind of a, a, a fall guy or something or uh, stupid just for stupid sake, you know, and I think that side of it, I could see why he would say that, you know, you have to love what you spoof. I think in order to take the energy and the time and all that goes into, like, the making of a film like Spaceballs, you must love it. You have to love it. I've come to love Star Wars, Star Trek, except for Star Crap. I won't see Star Crap. Ludicrous speed! Go! Peter Donovan was so great in supervising all our special effects. There was no question in Mel's mind that he wanted to do everything as well as or better than Star Trek the TV series, Star Wars. So everything was very real, very exciting, very space-ish, and I made it Jewish. I just tweaked it a little. A funny effect is really the real effect with some extension. <laughs> Everything does have to be as good, if not better, because you better show us that you're expert and you know what you're doing, because we're fans of the first one. We actually set out to do really, really first-class work. Perfect. You are wonderful. Thank you. Let's do it again. Just do it a little better. Is a, it was a very curious guy. He had seen Ruthless People, the first movie I did, and it's just a small part in it, and he liked it a lot. And then he and Ann came to uh, this theater center, and I was doing a, a production of this very bizarre Belgian play. I actually went to see a play called Barabbas, and Bill Pullman was playing Barabbas, and he was great. He had really serious acting chops. He liked the performance and talked to me afterwards and, and then hired me. When I went to meet with Mel, uh, I remember thinking that, 
you know, I wasn't going to get this. I wasn't going to be right. And I wasn't, because um, I didn't think of myself as big slapstick, broad comedy. And I had just seen Robbie Reiner's um, The Sure Thing, and she was terrific in it. But he said playing it real or playing it straight is half of the comedy. I know these face bums are all alike. Fat, ugly, buck tooth, knock knee, fierce willing pigs. It was a social thing that I met Mel Brooks. He said to me, you know, you're not fat, but you have a fat man's face. We'll just pad you and everything because your face has got the right look for it. He said, would you want to do it? I said, yeah. I said, gee, that would be great. I know very little about Dot Matrix and Spaceballs because I was called in as kind of a Band-Aid person. I was called in after Spaceballs was done. It was my voice that was used. Uh, Loreen Yarnell actually plays Dot Matrix. She could move. She could do these robotic moves great with her body, but she didn't have the right comic voice. I got a call from Mel, and he said, uh, how would you like to come in and write some jokes and do this character? And I said, great. So I knew nothing about I didn't even know what the movie was about. That was my virgin alarm. It's programmed to go off before you do. Before uh, Spaceballs came up, I was doing Hill Street Blues. Uh, so it was quite a shift. I get a call one day from my agent saying, Mel Brooks wants to see you. Every spaceship needs kind of an accountant mind, you know? When uh, Mel called me to talk to me about Spaceballs, um, he wanted me to come in and work with Rick. So here I had Mel again, and I had the potential of working with Rick, who I was a big fan of. Fire a warning shot across her nose. Rick was what you call a great pain in the ass. That is, he'd always finish a take, and he'd say, let's do it again in this next take. Why don't you say this, and I say this, and you say this? He was always right. Careful, you idiot. I said across her nose, not up it. And he was a ple really, I say penny, but he was a pleasure to work with, because anybody who's so giving and loving and creative is very valuable. What's his name? That is his name, sir. Asshole. Major asshole. And his cousin? He's an asshole too, sir. Gunner's mate, first class, Philip Asshole. How many assholes we got on this ship, anyhow? Yo! There were a lot of assholes. All the assholes were good. Everybody who played an asshole was wonderful. I knew it. I'm surrounded by assholes. Rick also suggested very early, when I was talking to him on the phone about the part, that John Candy would be a great barf. And uh, I think he called John. <laughs> Hi! Who are you? Barf. Not in here, mister. This is a Mercedes. The spaceship crashes, and he gets caught, and he goes back, and he ad-libbed. Oh, that's going to leave a mark. Yeah, well, normally I... Oh, that's going to leave a mark. And that was so... You can't... You cannot buy that. My name is John... No, I'm kidding. Take two. My name is Peter Donnan, and I was the visual effects supervisor on Spaceballs. I had done a little bit of work on Star Trek, the TV series, the original TV series. I had worked for the trailer company that had done the trailers on Star Wars, so I was familiar with the work that existed and sort of what the benchmark was. My name is Nick McLean. I was the director of photography on Spaceballs. We discuss angles. But nothing about film or looks. His main focus was, was it funny? He told me, Nick, comedy is, is bright. In other words, you have to see the people. You have to see their expressions. He was admirably professional in every setup. And he says, also, I'm Jewish, and I pay for that wall back there. I want to see that wall back there. He's very careful with Daphne Zuniga, who uh, was Princess Vespa. He said, you know, a girl's got to be beautiful. And I said, I agree. That's why we go to the movies. Men got to be good looking. Girls got to be beautiful. I never yelled at him for taking a little extra time to shadow her face properly and light her. As good a cinematographer as anybody could ever want. And good natured. The only thing I, I didn't like about Nick was that he wore sandals. What? I'm Ben Nye. I was uh, the makeup designer on Spaceballs. I was introduced to Spaceballs through John Candy and working with John Candy. I think he kind of uh, went to whoever through his agents and however that works, had me assigned to the movie. 
it seemed like a great opportunity to do some interesting makeup, so I was happy to be department head. Do I get this at the end of the movie? Do I get to keep this? Yes, sir. It was a really joyously good experience on a professional level. I mean, we had Harold Michelson, who had been Alfred Hitchcock's storyboard artist. We had Nicky McLean as our director of photography, who had probably been, if not the greatest, one of the greatest camera operators was ever in Hollywood, Don Feld, a fabulous costume designer, Conrad Buff, who went on to cut True Lies, Terry Marsh, certainly a great production designer who had worked with David Lean on Dr. Zhivago. We just had the cream of the crop all the way through and everybody was, you know, sort of joyously contributing to this experience that Mel had set us down the road on. do a, a big budget movie and this was this was a you know a, a, a well-financed studio film one of the wonderful things is that they're going to create these sets they did a wonderful job of creating the Spaceballs world for us as actors Terrence Marsh everything he designed uh, even the Winnebago or Princess Vespa's quarters everything was correct and then just stretched out of shape just a little bit so that you'd be aware of, of the comic frame around everything. And it was great to shoot at MGM, one of the greatest studios. The gate driving in, little goosebumps. Hello, I'm Mel Brooks, you're MGM, it's, this is all good. Wizard of Oz was shot in that soundstage 39 where we shot a lot of our kind of Wizard of Oz scenes. And the fact that it was all gonna be torn down and gone after we were out of there made it feel like it was kind of an important movie, even though it was kind of a silly movie, you know, kind of light entertainment, but it had this kind of sense of, uh, this is going to be the last chapter of piece of history. How did I do it? What did we do? Well, first of all, we did 267 shots. And I had long discussions with Mel, with Terry Marsh, with Ezra Swerdlow, who's one of the producers, about funny effects. And obviously, you know, a flying Winnebago is like a funny idea. The world's longest star cruiser is a funny idea. But the whole premise for all of it was more about making it so that they were amused by the ideas, not necessarily making the work crude. The miniatures and the world of the miniatures was amazing. For the bridge, we had what at the time was one of the largest blue screens anybody had ever attempted. It was 35 feet high and 135 feet wide. There was this theory, and I, I don't know if it really was true or not, that the uh, blue screen hurt your eyes. They scared the hell out of us. They said, don't look at the blue screen. They gave us yellow glasses. We had special sunglasses. So we all were wearing yellow glasses. Turned out that that's a myth. I mean, it didn't, didn't mean anything. When you act with a blue screen, it's literally that, a blue screen. And so a lot of your acting school training comes back. That's what a good actor is. He acts to nothing. The hardest thing was imagining all the stuff that was going on. Eventually, there's going to be a spaceship there. You just throw all pride out the window and you just react. And then you pray that they're going to stick in the right image at the right moment. Because if they mess it up, you could look really stupid. We had a wonderful costume designer. Don Feld, D-O-N, one word, Don Feld. Je suis Don Feld, who the hell are you? And he was a genius. A uh, Hollywood legend, and so uh, I went in and just was putty in his hands. I was amazed at Don Feld's original sketches, and I said, don't go any further, just nail these, get these into costumes, and, and, and he, we, we stayed very close to his original designs. He was very creative in making a helmet that could strap on to Rick Moranis where he could actually walk around with it, and, and it wouldn't hit the floor, it wouldn't throw him over it. He created the balls for space balls, the, the, the ball helmets, and the wedding dress, and he was just wonderful with textures and with space elements. Everything would shine and be just a little too spacey, you know? 
He was a little spacey himself. In real life, I have very little hair, and as you can see. But uh, they gave me a wig. You know, it was nice for a bald man to all of a sudden have all this hair. I liked it. It was the hair we were very concerned about. The ears ride so high, dog's ears are up here. A minor blocked off down here. I give myself big sideburns here on the side and a DA in the back to the ponytail, so I tried to be a very cool dog. John wanted to have some appliance on his face to make him look like a dog. Mel said, we don't want to cover John Candy's face. We're paying all this money to see this guy who's really funny. He's got this funny face. and No, we really don't want to cover it up. So I said, what about if we give you doggy ears and maybe a, a patch? Funny. We started out with the desert, and uh, that was the first shooting I did, anyway, it was out in Yuma, Arizona. If you do more than one take in sand, you've ruined the pristine quality of the sand, so I mean, it, would, it would drive us nuts. We had to get a blower, or we had to get a sand broom. Worse than that was lunch. There was nowhere in, in near Yuma to eat lunch. It was hot and dusty. I felt really badly for Lorraine Yarnell. My God, Lorraine Yarnell had a trudge in the C-3PO mock-up. She had a real tough time, probably more difficult than most, because she couldn't actually see where she was going. And it must have been easily 120 degrees in that thing. We'd have to keep opening the mask so that she could breathe and she'd just be dripping with sweat. I mean, it was so hot out there. This poor woman, I think, lost a lot of weight and water weight. I mean, and she was tiny to start with. She was a trooper. She was a real trooper. I'll tell you the costume that I really enjoyed more than mine and was jealous of was, was Rick's costume because, of course, Rick was had the big helmet. Everybody got that? Rick would try and break me up just before we would do a take, but he'd drop the visor. Never have that damn thing down in front of me! So he could laugh his little took us off, and no one knew. And I'm ruining the take because I'm laughing. And all I see are his little knees shaking a little bit. That's all because his helmet was down. I wanted that helmet. I wanted that. The people in the picture all had a terrific sense of humor. And there was a lot of kidding around going on. We had a lot of laughs making this film. Sitting there with John Candy, who just goes off and you're crying and you're cracking up and makeup is, keeps touching you up. And then all of a sudden they're like, OK, speed rolling. <laughs> No, this isn't fair. I thought Mel was going to get mad. I thought, you know, costing a lot of film here. We keep ruining takes. But Mel was laughing harder than anybody. I forgave them. I forgave them all. I love laughter on a set. <laughs> <laughs> and that's why I think Spaceballs works. We laughed more making that film than people laugh watching it. As much as they laugh, yeah, it was uh, enormously funny and satisfying for people to work on that film. And that's Mel. Adjectives to describe Mel Brooks. Good kisser. My best friend. Wacky. Very funny. Good kisser. Concise. Hilarious. Wonderful enthusiasm. Creative. Lustrous. My lover. Slimy. Bizarre. Tall, dark, and handsome. He's a very short man. Good natured. Brilliant. Somewhat mean. Direct. Knowledgeable. Burps too much. Great creativity. Erudite. Avuncular. Insane. Compassionate. But a good insane. Perfect. I'm always the best. Well, I was the shortest. Mel Brooks is everybody's favorite uncle. He's your uncle because he genuinely cares about you. He's involved in your life. You, you're part of a family when you work with Mel. I like people. I give them advice whether they need it or not. Don't carry it that way. Hold it on your hip, you won't get a hiney. I help everybody. It's great working with Mel. On the set, he's, you know, he's a very funny man, but he's very nice, very serious, though, on the set. As a force of nature, Mel Brooks can be intimidating. But all in the nature of kind of really, let's not, let's not miss a moment of opportunity. Let's not be lazy. Let's not be self-congratulatory. You know, as afterwards, I've looked back on it and I realized how much I learned from the movie. You know, which about comedy, especially comedy in, um, in, in film as opposed to theater. And uh, 
it, you know, the, he was so rigorous. That was something I, you, you know, I really respect him for. You know, a lot of people think I'm their favorite uncle uh, because I appeared on television in Mad About You, and I played Uncle Phil. And uh, when I played Uncle Phil, I played him with his hair up like this. And I would talk with a little Jewish accent and a voice, and I would be very energetic, and they liked that character. Mel Brooks, I walked in thinking, oh, it's going to be working for a comic. And I walked out eight hours later with such respect for him. The man is absolutely brilliant, knows his work, knows his background. He's wonderful, absolutely wonderful. I remember very specifically how he interacted with me. Bring it up, make it bigger. If we have to sit and wait for you to find your motivation, we're gonna be out of the theater. And I yell at my actors, make it big, make it grand. I like it to be larger than life because an audience wants things to happen in a movie that could never happen to them. They want big, gorgeous, beautiful things. They can't dance like Fred Astaire, but they can dream of dancing with Ginger Rogers like Fred Astaire. Mel, as a director, paid attention to everything that went on. Mel used to say, no styrofoam cups on my sets. Never play this again. Because in every single movie that he had ever had, somewhere in his mind, in the background, in some scene, there was a styrofoam cup that some grip, some electrician, some set decorator, some painter, some prop man had had himself a cup of coffee and set it there. That's the curse of allowing the crew to use styr white styrofoam cups. You'll always see them in the periphery of a movie. So we had paper cups. So Mel was involved in everybody's job. Mel's way of working uh, involves a lot of improvisation. No matter what preparation you do, no matter what rehearsals you have, it all changes as soon as you're in front of a camera. He was really good about letting people experiment and, and explore. It's not always the most important thing whether that improvisation works or not for that specific scene. Um, what's important to the actor is that it, it's indicative of the kind of freedom you have. And the best part of that freedom is if it's not working, He's going to have some very specific ideas of how you do it. If the director realizes what the writer had in mind and the actors can nail it, that's a lot better than improvisation. Do it like this. You kind of go to the set kind of wondering what the heck's going to happen sometimes. Usually Mel got his way. <laughs> Mel likes to do a lot of takes. Many, many takes. 10, 12, 15 takes. Lots and lots and lots of takes. He's not cheap about it. He uses up a lot of film. A lot of actors get anxious about getting line readings from directors. Mel gives you line readings um, sometimes. I loved it because uh, it was intimidating because he did it funnier than you were going to do it. That was the only problem with it. When he gives you one, it's perfect. You should put it in your pocket and keep it there. Don't forget it because it doesn't miss. The key to my character, and, and Mel and I talked about this in the beginning, Colonel Sanders is second banana, which is a term most people understand uh, from back from vaudeville days. You, know, the, you set up the comedic character as a second banana. You bring the jokes to him on a tray. That's what I always think about when I remember Spaceballs was uh, how much fun it can be to be a second banana. Hello, Lone Star. Hello, Vinny. What do you want? It's not what I want. It's what he wants. <laughs> Pizza the Hut! Richard Caron played Pizza the Hut. He was inside this huge canvas type thing that had um, all this actual cheese pizza over it. And to keep the pizza hot, they had a wire going through it. And it was bubbling. We'd shoot a scene, and that's okay, we gotta get ready for another take. And all of a sudden, I hear, It's good! It's smoke! I look down and he's smoking. <laughs> Smoke is coming out from the wire that, that was heating up the pizza. I said, Mel, fire! They pick up this whole thing and he comes out, he's all, ah. Mel says, come on, one more take! Mel played yogurt and um, when we were doing the scenes with yogurt, he would say, okay, everyone, you know, get ready, set, speed, rolling, action. <laughs> He'd do his thing. The kids love this one. And he'd say, cut, perfect, brilliant, move it on, you know. Of course, after like, 
I tried that with my takes once after the end. He'd say, cut. I'd go, perfect, brilliant, move on. He'd say, uh, perfect, let's do it again. And for my part, I was, you know, young kid. <laughs> and Mel wanted me to shut up all the time. But uh, always with affection. If you just aim for the place you're going, you'll fall short of it. You've got to aim beyond it to reach it. It's never as good as you want it to be. But then again, it's never as bad as you think it's going to be. But you've got to give it everything you got. You don't go to work, you go to art. It's your vision, it's your love, it's your hope, it's your heart. You give your soul to the, to the film, and you hope that it lands on its feet and that people, you know, will enjoy it. I think I knew at the time that it was going to be what it was. All of a sudden, the last six months, I have kids from about nine to about 15 coming up to me. They don't mention Ada's enough at all. They don't even know about it. It's all they talk, you're King Roland from Spaceballs. In other words, that film has become a cult thing with young kids, they love it. College campuses, dorm rooms, they watch it eight, 10 times, you know, on a weekend. And then I thought, wow, this movie is, of all the movies that have done, really like a virus got in people's brains and they couldn't get rid of it. It's all about the timing or the era or publicity, whatever, but people that come up to me now today, that's what I love. I mean, I never would have dreamed that all these years later, you know, I'd be signing Princess Vespa pictures or autographs or, or being reminded of lines that I had in the movie. I know that in my area, People look at it 10 and 15 years later and say, you know what, the work that we did then in 1986 and 1987 holds up today. A lot of kids, little kids who see it, have no regard for its, its satiric aspects. They don't care that it's making fun of anything. They like the story, and that's what good satire is. It has become a big cult film for children. Kids to this day grab me on the street and say, oh, space balls, space balls. And I always say, no, 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 just my voice. And then I, I feel, oh, hell with it. Yeah, space balls. Hang on, Barpo, we're gonna make space tracks. My biggest video sales, you would think that it would be Blazing Saddles and Young Frankenstein. But the two movies are Robin Hood, Men in Tights, and Spaceballs. And that's because of young people. Kids love it, you know, and adults get it. The experience was great. We had a wonderful bunch of folks talented people, great cast. It was a great, great experience. So, may the Schwartz be with you.